welcome to Tall Tales, Amata. <clears throat> Thank you. It's good to be with you. And uh, I, I was just talking about Resolution 56, which I'm sure you're quite familiar with, correct? Uh, yes. Our local resolution. Mm -hmm. And and you you know that it uh, is asking that the uh, House Committee Subcommittee on Territories pass their resolution two fifty not two seventy nine, which I've talked about extensively. Uh, yes. and from from the standpoint of if Downs versus Bidwell is overruled, the Constitution applies to the five insular territories of its own force. And things like self determination, et cetera, are gone, and paying self uh, federal income tax arrive. And I think yeah. that the, the most egregious aspect of that would be for American Samoa. So you might want to uh, enlighten our obvious our audience here about the effect of that on both folks in American Samoa. Yes. Well, thank you very much for. Uh letting me be on your show here. You know, I, I had a couple of thoughts with regard to the Guam resolution, and it, it cites the use of the words savages and peonage in SCOTUS opinions and, and Navy documents as examples of racist words and practices that justify rejection of reliance on such SCOTUS opinions. But both those same terms are used on the SCOTUS opinion in Wong Kim Ark, including quotes cited favorably in Wong Kim Ark ruling from other SCOTUS opinions. I mean, why is it demanded that insular cases cannot be used because of racism, but equally American relies on Wong Kim Ark in the Fiji Semanu case, even though it has equally offensive racial content? And I think the fact that uh, Wong Kim Ark did not deny U.S. citizenship clearly acquired by birth in a state, it doesn't matter. But Wong Kim Ark upheld the Chinese Exclusion Act, which is far more racist, it seems to me, than the um, insular cases. But uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to, to talk a little bit about our concerns with the tinkering uh, with the insular cases. I just got in from Hawaii, as a matter of fact, today, where I spent the last uh, three days with meetings and stuff. And first, I, I want to explode one myth that's being perpetuated by some special interest groups. American Samoans are U.S. nationals, but that does not make us U.S. second-class citizens. Anyone born on U.S. soil is an American, but Americans come in two categories. You're either a U.S. citizen or a U.S. national. And being a U.S. citizen does not give a Guamanian any more rights or privileges than a Samoan. I mean, if a Samoan moved here or the states and wanted to vote or get a government job that requires citizenship for national security, there's a simple procedure for doing that. And I also have introduced a bill in the U.S. House that would even simplify that further. But what's happened is that a special interest group looking for national voting rights for people in the territories have taken it upon themselves to find some Samoans who live in the states to sue the federal government to make them citizens automatically. I mean, we are nationals by virtue of congressional legislation, and Guamanians are U.S. citizens also by legislation. So the special interests are hoping the court will make everyone citizen by virtue of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. And then once the court does that, they can come back and say that under the equal protection provision, all citizens in the territories would then have to vote for president. The problem is that we in American Samoa, we like being nationals because the U.S. Constitution does not fully apply to us in our territory. And no one by virtue of having U.S. citizenship can sort of come in and buy land in American Samoa. We have communal land ownership. We don't have much land anyway, and we're pretty stingy about it. And anyway, we want to keep it that way. 
I, I, I don't know. I think the problem for Guam is that if the court declares us citizens, they would rob us of our ability to make that determination for ourselves. And the promise of self-determination is sacred to us. It's a promise the United States made when we agreed to U.S. sovereignty 121 years ago. And, you know, unlike any other territory, outsiders cannot come in and buy land or even establish residence with government permission. We control our own borders, our own immigration, our own customs system, and even our legislature, in part, is selected by customary means, not direct election. And that would be the Senate side. But um, most importantly, we were not acquired by the U.S. as spoils of war or purchased from some European or Asian power. So we have a completely different history from our sister territories. The framework of our constitutional relationship with the U.S. is embodied in the uh, insular cases. And if those cases were voided without Congress establishing another framework at the same time, I think the tenets of our relationship would be vulnerable to challenge. And if our status as nationals could be changed by the court, couldn't they also do away with our land tenure system, bring our borders under federal control, allow non-Samoans uh, to live in American Samoa, and change the way we elect our Senate? And if they could take away our self-determination, the precedent would be established to do the same thing in Guam. I, I mean, you know, a Guamanian recently told me the reason they want the legislature to endorse the Grijalva resolution is to make it easier for Guam to be eligible for SSI. But, you know, enactment of the Grijalva resolution is not necessary for that. Eligibility for any federal program equal to what states get merely a matter of Congress passing a law making it so. And the trade-off for surrendering self-determination is too great. This is why I cannot support the Grijalva resolution and would urge the Guam legislature to look hard before taking that leap. I do support the resolution's condemnation of the racist language, absolutely. It was used by justices in their opinions back in the day. But the resolution at the same time, it must call for not relying on the insular cases in the future. Only once Congress has enacted legislation to replace the framework for constitutional arrangements for the territories. I think the resolution also should call for Congress to give full equality to territories for all programs for which states are eligible. And I really think that's that's overdue, and and my colleagues and I uh, from the territories we we uh, we're pushing that. But with those changes, I'd be happy to support the resolution. I'd like to be able to support Chairman Grijalva's resolution, and I will be proposing language when the resolution comes before the U.S. House Judiciary Committee. And uh, so, you know. Um, that's kind of where we are on that score. Well, very well put, uh, uh, Amata. I, I think anyone who's listening could not help but extend, understand exactly uh, what your situation is. I, I'd want to, want to just make a couple of comments here. If Downs were overruled and the Constitution applied of its own force, it would be like a fish trap. We could we would swim into being a, an incorporated territory, but we could never swim out. The only way out of the, being an incorporated territory is to become a state, and I don't think that's going to happen to Samoa or or Guam. Uh, the second. Yes, I agree. Uh, the second thing was that, uh, as I recall, you introduced you were able to get. Uh, the Congress to pass a resol excuse me a statute that makes naturalization quick and easy for folks from Samoa residing in the mainland. Isn't that correct? Well, we've introduced it. It's it's making its way through the process, and um, <laughs> it's interesting that just that term naturalization is probably not really accurate because. 
and yet the federal government has had it in their uh, statutes all this time. But uh, we are not trying to get U.S. nationals naturalized, at, that, at least those who want to become U.S. citizens. We're trying to, it, it, it's more of a reclassification. Okay. Because U.S. nationals are already Americans. Uh -huh. Naturalization is the process that aliens use to become U.S. citizens. That's correct. Yeah. So, at any rate, um, I feel very good about the prospects of the bill. It's, it's really a very, very simple uh, bill that I have. And, and again, um, many of our American Samoans prefer to uh, remain as U.S. nationals. I happen to be a U.S. citizen myself, but um, many do uh, think it's, uh, it, it's good for them to stay as U.S. nationals. And, and many of them are the ones who, who live down in American Samoa, become heavily involved in the traditional customs. I am too. I'm heavily involved in the traditional customs. I'm, I'm a high chief in American Samoa, which there are very few women who uh, achieved that status, but at any rate, um, um, that's where we are on that. That's interesting, Amata. Amata, you're not a stranger to Guam either, are you? Oh my gosh, no. Guam is, a, I consider Guam my second home. And as a matter of fact, a few years ago when Dr. Robert Underwood invited me to come and deliver a lecture for the presidential lecture series, I just jumped at the chance because it was a chance to come back to Guam. And, um, you know, so he then asked me if I had a title for my lecture. And I said, yes, my road to Congress runs through Guam. And so, I mean, it was back in the days when I think the McDonald's was the largest in the world or something like it's been a few years now uh -huh. when I went to the University of Guam it was, I think it was College of Guam they, they still had some Quonset huts there and um, <clears throat> I enjoyed my time there very much I've been able to get back there uh, in the last several years on a couple of co congressional delegation trips and 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 uh, so I look for every opportunity to try to make it back to my second home there. So you, you're a UOG graduate, correct, Amata? I am. And as a matter of fact, I was the only UOG graduate in Congress ever, which is interesting. And then when Mike Tan Nicholas came along, he's also a graduate of, of the University of Guam. So it's just the two of us. A natural choice. Uh, and, and and you have spent some time in in at least Saipan because your father was a deputy high commissioner of the trust territory and then was a district administrator in uh, several districts in the trust territory also, correct? Yes, yes. I spent quite a bit of time there as well as the Marshall Islands. And uh, you make friends, you learn the language, the languages, and it, it's a... Uh, it's a, a very important part of my my life and my and fond memories that I have of of that area. But uh, when he finished his first term as governor of American Samoa, President Eisenhower, it was the end of his term. And then when President Kennedy came in, he decided to uh, send my father to the Marshall Islands, and and of course. Nobody knew where the Marshall Islands was. We knew very little about it. I was a very little girl then. And uh, so he he left the governorship to become the chief executive of the Marshall Islands. And, well, um, I do have 10 brothers. The boys all stayed, and they went to school there uh, in Madrill. And then um, my parents thought it best to send me to school in Honolulu, where we had family. So uh, for the next four years, I attended Sacred Hearts Academy in, in Kaimuki, and I lived in a convent where my dad's sister was a semi-cloistered nun. And um, so, but the Marshall Islands was my first introduction to Micronesia and uh, the next stop on my road to Guam. And then as I was finishing high school, my parents were asked to come to Saipan, 
where Dad became the chief executive of the Northern Marianas, which today is known as governor and the chief executive of the Marshall Islands in those days, of course, today is known as president. But um, I first set foot on Guam while I was en route to Saipan. And um, once again, there being no college at all in American Samoa, um, that is the reason why uh, I was encouraged to, to go to school, go to college off island. And I mean, I could have gone to the University of Hawaii, but I think my parents felt that they wanted to broaden my horizons and keep me from spending too much time on the beach. <laughs> huh. But uh, one of the reasons I was attracted to, to Los Angeles, I ultimately went to Loyola Marymount, was that we also had relatives there. And and so just, that I, just as I had gone home to Madro every summer, from school in Honolulu. While I was at college in Los Angeles, I also went home every summer. And uh, while I was there, um, I, I got a job in Saipan, uh, working for the Peace Corps Micronesia. And um, at that time, they were, it was the first time they were bringing Peace Corps trainees to learn the language in country. So I was a, a, a staff assistant to the languages coordinator and we the, the whole program was set up at Hopwood High School so these are really very fond memories and um, but um, still in all when you go away to school like that you know and you really I never really wanted to go away to school I wanted to be where my parents were you know and I think it's not the easiest thing to get adjusted like that when you're fresh off the boat, as it were. And so um, while I was still there in uh, Los Angeles, it just seemed that I needed to go back home to the islands. And by then, the College of Guam had become the University of Guam. And so I enrolled. And uh, when I first got there, I, I actually went, and, and stayed at the Micronesia Hotel. But I couldn't study because it was so loud, people drinking all night long and the mu music so loud, I, I just couldn't get anything done. But um, the president of the University of, of Guam, I'll never forget, Dr. Antonio Yamashita and his wife, you know, they, um, they were happy to give me a, whole, a room in their, their home. So I, I just can't thank the Yamashitas enough for their kindness and understanding. And if uh, Mrs. Lorraine Yamashita is listening, thank you from the bottom of my heart. But uh, they they just were so nice to me. Many times I'd get out of my last class and I'd go to their home way after dinner. And even though the family might have gone off to bed, Mrs. Yamashita she always left dinner in the oven for me, and I, I especially loved uh, the beef steak. So, I mean, I wouldn't be where I am today without the help of this very kind family. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I talked to Dr. Robert Underwood, he told me that Mrs. Yamashita uh, is still with us. And so I was able to see her for a little while when I was there. Uh, delivering this lecture. So it was such a thrill, I just had no idea. And uh, so, um, but uh, I, I can tell you that it's my my year that I spent at the University of Guam, as far as my college years, that is the time that I truly enjoyed and that I, I really care about. And, you know, I I was... Sorry to leave at the time. Guam was on the verge of a new chapter in its history. And a year later, they elected their own governor and member of Congress. And the previous summer, when I was home on Saipan, I met a young man who was part of a White House National Security Task Force doing a survey of the economic development of the islands. And when he came to Saipan, we would 
get together and drink coffee and talk. And so in 1970, when Antonio Wontat came to Congress, um, although I was three credits short, I couldn't resist the urge to take a job I had been offered in Washington, D.C. So the young man who later became my husband, he would also come to Guam, too, as kind of part of his job. But at that same time, American Samoa elected its own delegate at large to Washington, and uh, I went to work for him, Paramount Chief Fuimono. He was looking for somebody who was fluent in both cultures, could speak English and then deal with um, the Samoan-speaking constituents when they came to town. So one of the things I did way back then was to join the Guam Society of America in Washington, D.C., and now, my God, I think it's more than 50 years now that Fred and I have been members of the Guam Society of America, and um, we look forward to that every year, especially the Christmas party, but they always have the best Chamorro food, and that's always something that attracts people to come. So sure. my oldest and longest friends, uh, they came from Guam, you know. And actually there was no American Samoa Society until much, much later. But the Guam Society was already organized, and so I I became an active participant over those many years. And I went on to work with the, uh, for the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, American Samoa decided to elect its own governor, and I don't want to talk your ear off, but then another opportunity came back to to me to, to go to Guam and Saipan. So I'm always looking for reasons to to come to to Guam, and um, so I'm not surprised to see how much progress has been made in Guam because it's just it's it's. It really, Guam occupies a special place in my heart. Well, that's very interesting, Amata. We're, we're going to have to take a break here. The Extra Point with Jerry Roberts. Not quite yet, Thank Jose. You. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, you've established your street cred here. You're not a stranger to Guam, so is there something you'd like to tell Tina Rose Munya Barnes and the and the 36th Guam Legislature about their resolutions? Something like maybe don't pass it? <clears throat> well, yes, I I, um, I think they're they're on the right track, but just to keep it simple, I really just think that um, the um, what you want to do is don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Condemn the racist part of the uh, uh, of this resolution. I mean the insular cases, but do not throw the entire framework out until such time that Congress has replaced it with something else. Because if you throw it out, it will not only be detrimental to American Samoa, but I do believe that it it may become detrimental to Guam down the road sometime in the future. But I wish her the very best. I consider her a friend. She did such a great job when uh, she uh, testified during the hearing we had on May 12th here in Washington. And uh, I want to thank you again, Bob, very much for giving me this opportunity. It's really great talking. Take care. Really great talking with you, uh, Amata. And, and until mm -hmm. next time, I'll just have to say tofa. Too small. Take care. <laughs> Goodbye.